Hi, YouTubers. This is Lonnie Clark. Um, I'm going to read more of the book that we're reading together, Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution by John Goffman, Arthur Tamplin and John Goffman. Um, we are on page 133. We're now in Chapter 6, which is titled Tragedy on the Colorado Plateau. So I'm just going to dig right in. As you can see, whoo, we're more than halfway through the book, so... Uh, we've just got a little bit more of this project to do, so I'm just going to press on. What was abundantly clear to everyone was that lung cancer was indeed occurring in relation to radon daughter exposure. And further, it was clear that those miners who worked in the dirtiest mines and thereby accumulated the highest working level month exposure in the course of their mining were the ones with the highest rates of development of lung cancer. Reasonable public health practice would have reached the conclusion that at lesser exposure, there would be fewer lung cancers in direct proportion to the lower exposure to radon daughters. But this would be too reasonable. What it appeared was desired by the promoters was direct proof, proof is in italics, of occurrence of extra lung cancers at each working level of exposure before condemning such exposure as unsafe. The great health physicist, Dr. Wa Walter S. Snyder, is an associate director of health physics divisions at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, pleaded at the hearings as follows. Those who prefer to base radiation protection on a threshold hypothesis, which is just as unproven and just as uncertain and unsupported by data as is the linear hypothesis, often charged that the linear hypothesis is too conservative. There is no evidence, as illustrated above, to show that it is conservative at all. However, one may wonder why it is considered so unreason undesirable to use the conservative criterion where human life is in question. Surely if the linear hypothesis is conservative and not in conflict with the data that are available, this is a point in its favor. When human life is in the balance, it would seem that conservatism is in safeguarding these lives has much to commend it. Our impression is that Dr. Snyder wasn't being listened to at the at at all insofar as any impact could be discerned as a result of his eloquent testimony. We have been criticized for statements made by us in writing that atomic energy developers demand the corpses of victims before they will cease doing that which is unsafe. You, the pros prospective victims, must prove with corpses that we're hurting you. Otherwise, we may proceed to irradiate you without any requirement of our proving safety at our promotional atomic energy activities. Yes, we have made such statements concerning several aspects of atomic energy development. And nowhere is the statement more appropriate than in the criticism of the handling of uranium miner problem, of the uranium mining problem. Subtitle. Men die as FRC pleads for more, quote, evidence, unquote. Instead of accepting Dr. Snyder's reasonable public health conservatism to protect, live, to protect the lives of the miners, the Federal Radiation Council concluded that at the highest level exposure in working level months, lung cancer was clearly in excess. But more evidence was required to be certain that lung cancer was truly occurring in excess at moderate or low working level month exposure. More evidence required by whom? By the uranium miner who stood to die from moderate exposures? Or by the miner's owners and operators who would bear the cost of ventilating the mines? Indeed, we have recently analyzed the very data which were already available for the 1967 hearings of the Joint Committee of Atomic Energy. Our conclusion is that quite adequate evidence was available then that
that excessive lung cancer was occurring not only at the high level exposure, but at intermediate and low level working exposures as well. And more than that, if anything, the evidence indicated strongly that one unit of exposure was more effective in producing lung cancer in the low exposure range than in the higher exposure range. So even though, as Dr. Snyder pointed out, one should always err on the side of protecting the public where knowledge is scant. In this particular case, even the knowledge then available was adequate to arrive at the conclusion that lung cancer could be expected at low or moderate radon daughter exposures, and more lung cancer could be expected at higher radon daughter exposures. But unwelcome answers are rarely, are rarely sought with diligence. Subtitle, The False Hope of a Safe Threshold. Here we go, folks. In a now predictable fashion, the bad pennies of atomic energy development have a way of showing up again and again. We refer to the ever-present bad penny hope of atomic energy developers that, quote, maybe a safe threshold exists. Maybe below some level of radon daughter exposure, there won't be any extra cases of lung cancers among the miners, unquote. We have pointed out that we have pointed out elsewhere in this book the cruel hoax the cruel hoax aspects of translating such unfounded hopes into policy setting with respect to exposure limits of human beings to radioactivity. And we have pointed out that every responsible body, including the International Commission of Radiological Protection and the Federal Radiation Council, refuses to consider such thre thresholds in practice simply because no convincing evidence has ever been provided to justify such hopes. Why then didn't the Federal Radiation Council insist on similar conservatism for the uranium mi miners? No answer. And let us consider the dialogue that went on at the famous Joint Committee hearings. Professor Robley Evans, uh, he is a professor of physics at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. <clears throat> professor Robley Evans, speaking to Congressman Hosmer, said, I am perfectly glad to turn the statement around the other way. I believe in a positive sense that one to three working levels and a total accumulation of three to four hundred working level months is innocuous to man. The odd safe threshold concept at its best. Reassurance that below three hundred working level months no lung cancers would occur in the uranium miners. Apparently the two chief promoters of the JCAE Chairman Holyfield and Representative Hosmer were inordinately pleased with this totally unsupported, unjustified, optimistic prediction. Why shouldn't they be? Such a prediction of zero risk meant that the heat was momentarily off with respect to cleaning up the air with, at which the unfortunate uranium miners had to breathe. So let's read that sentence again. I want to read it again. Professor Robley Evans, speaking to Congressman Hosmer, said, I'm perfectly glad to turn the statement around the other way. I believe, in a positive sense, that one to three working levels and a total accumulation of three to 300 to 400 working level months is innocuous to man. Can you believe these rats? Oh, he must have gotten paid a lot of money to make that statement. But the enthusiastic reception of the hopeful, though negligent, predictions of no hazard was to be very short-lived for one reason. Facts have a way of becoming evident to everyone, can we say Fukushima? Just two short years later, two short years later, in one of the most important papers ever published, 
Doctors London and Archer. <clears throat> Dr. Frankie London is associated with occupational with Occupational Studies Unit, Division of Environmental Health Science, National Institute of Health. Dr. Victor E. Archer is with Occupational Health Program, National Center for Urban and Industrial Health, Bureau of Disease and Prevention and Environmental Control. Just two short years later, in one of the most important papers ever published, Drs. London and Archer <clears throat> and their colleagues presented not hopeful, glowing, optimistic predictions, but the grim, horrible facts. Not only were the lung cancers occurring at the 300 working at the 300 level months, let me repeat that. Not only were lung cancers occurring at the 300 working level months predicted by Professor Evans to be innocuous, they were occurring at four times the expected rate, even at the 180 working level months. Where safety had been predicted based upon unsupported blue sky optimism, tragedy was the result in the form of a massive increase in the frequency of fatal lung cancers among the unsuspecting uranium miners. Men who rely, who rely upon scientists to know enough to help protect them from unnecessary injury. Subtitle. The AEC doesn't learn from mistakes. <clears throat> it must be obvious to everyone that no criticism is intended either for the hopeful congressman or the super optimistic scientist without science, sound scientific evidence. That is, criticism of any willful negligence. Not at all. I'm going to read that again. I'm sorry, you guys. I'm sorry I'm not the best reader, but I'm going to press on. It must be obvious to everyone that no criticism is intended either of the hopeful congressman or super optimistic scientists without sound scientific evidence. That is, criticism of any willful ne neglect. Not at all. But who is to protect the public and the workers in the industry from arrogant confidence and fanciful hopes? Who has apologized to the uranium miners for the grievous injury, even though not intended? Whenever one predicts confidently that some procedure or action is safe, and that very action leads to death, one can, as a minimum, Hope that some humility will be learned thereby, even if the human lives are lost irreversibly. Certainly the uranium miners and their family must, as a result of this grave blunder, have lost confidence in scientists, science, technology, and in governmental watchdogs. Is there evidence that the lesson of humility and shame over the tragic, unnecessary deaths of uranium miners was learned by the Congressional AEC Hawks? No. In fact, the opposite is the case, and this deserves careful scrutiny. The Secretary of Labor, then Willard Wirtz, a very responsible man with a high concern for the laborer's welfare, apparently studied the records of the uranium mining industry quite carefully, and apparently appreciated quite deeply the sound testimony presented in the uranium miner hearings. He must further have appreciated quite well the sound advice provided by Dr. Walter Snyder. So, whereas the Federal Radiation Council in its September 1967 report recommended allowing one working level in the uranium mines, a level that would approximately double lung cancer in miners after eight years of working in the mines. The Secretary of Labor was not satisfied with such lax standards and issued a Labor Department set of radiation standards for mining requiring that by January 1st, 1969, all levels of uranium, all levels in uranium mines must be reduced by 0.3 working level. 30% of the recommendations by the Radiation Council. 
The judgment and courage of Mr. Wirtz deserves the highest commendation and praise. New subtitle. FRC's unique benefit versus risk approach. <clears throat> this will be interesting. Let us contrast the order of Mr. Wirtz with the factors that occupied the Federal Radiation Council. The FRC said that major findings of immediate interest to the derivation of guidance for radiation protection in uranium miners are as follows. One, uranium is currently the basic fuel needed for the development of nuclear energy, and all projections point to the increasingly important role for nuclear energy in meeting national electric power requirements. And two, uranium mining is an important economic asset to the states in which the ore is mined. In addition to the value of the ore, mining provides important opportunities for employment. What profound human concerns are expressed in these two statements of the Federal Radiation Council? The country needs cheap uranium for electric power generation so that the nuclear power can be completely can, can so that nuclear power can compete economically with other methods of electric power generation. Obviously, protection of the miners from lung cancer might increase the price of uranium, so death from lung cancer for miners helps nuclear electric power appear cheap. Wow, this is a very interesting FRC benefit versus risk approach. Hmm. Obviously, protection of the miners from lung cancer might increase the price of uranium. So death from lung cancer for miners helps nuclear electric power appear cheap. My God. New subtitle. Congressman Holyfield attacks Mr. Wirtz. Of course. On the second FRC statement that uranium mining as an economic asset to the states in which ore is mined. What is the economic asset worth to a uranium miner dead of lung cancer and to his family? Strange, these benefit risk estimates, eh? Obviously, Mr. Wirtz was not especially impressed by the FRC considerations. He ordered more than a threefold reduction in the standards found acceptable by the FRC. But the battle to prevent the uranium miners from dying unnecessarily of lung cancer was by no means over. On October 30th, 1969, Congressman Holyfield, a champion congressional protector of the AEC, vented his anger over the totally responsible actions of Mr. Wirtz. We cannot refrain from quoting Congressman Holyfield. This is what Congressman Holyfield said. Secretaries of the Departments of Health, Education, and Welfare, and some others. And these people are laymen. They are not technically qualified. And this is one of the things that bothers this committee because we say the incident last year on the standards of the operation of the uranium mines, which was set as this committee determined, was an emotional basis rather than on a scientific basis. It is no secret that I said to Secretary Wirtz at this time that this is exactly what he was doing. Well now, Congressman Holyfield. Well now, Congressman Holyfield is reducing the radon daughter levels downward from a value capable of doubling lung cancer regarded to you as emotional the action of a layman? Okay. My goodness, I think I'll stop. We're at the top of page 139, and I'll pick it back up from here at the bottom of 138. Uh, we're just, I think we're coming on 20 minutes. I can't see the clock. I don't have my glasses on. Yeah, it's 19 minutes. So... I guess I'll talk to you guys later. Um, thanks for putting up with my horrible reading. <laughs> I appreciate it. So, um, you know, it's grim. It's not going to get better. 
for a long time. So I guess we have to have an attitude adjustment about it all. Uh, that doesn't mean we have to lay down and take it and just let them kill the rest of the planet. I'm going to keep reading and I'm going to press on. I'm going to keep pushing and we we need to find solutions. This this cannot go on like this. So, ciao you guys. Put your courage feet on. And your thinking cap. Let's come up with some solutions, eh? Ciao.